Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the fourth annual Catherine Wasserman Davis Memorial Lecture. Uh, the person you see on the screen here is Catherine Wasserman Davis, Wellesley class of 28, Wellesley's greatest benefactor and shameless Russophile like some of us in this room. Um, so uh, Catherine had a extremely long and fascinating career. She graduated from Wellesley in 1928 and in 1929 went horseback riding in the Caucasus uh, with uh, famed uh, anthropologist Leslie White. And she fell in love with the Soviet Union. So if you think about 1929, Stalin had really just consolidated his power and was be just launching the collectivization, the forced collectivization of the peasants. Uh, she retained uh, a lifelong interest in the Soviet Union, also in many projects for peace. Um, and in the arts, those of you who have been to the Davis Art Museum will know that it will, it's a no-brainer that a lot of the money for that museum came from the Davis family. Um, she had, had been to the Soviet Union at least 35 times. Um, many of them, although not most, uh, in the company of Professor Marshall Goldman, who taught at Wellesley for 50 years or so, um, and uh, was a very, very close to Catherine. In fact, he was the one who persuaded her to stop giving only to Wellesley and to give money to Harvard, um, and to the Harvard Russian Research Center, which became the Davis Center for Russian um, and Eurasian Studies. She was an absolutely wonderful woman um, who had uh, many contacts. If we could take a look at the next slide, um, here she is with Margaret Thatcher um, and her husband, who was amb Nixon's ambassador to uh, Switzerland, although this is much later. It's obviously much later than the Nixon era. Um, she died at the age of 106 in 2013, uh, and one of her legacies was that after her death, there should be a Davis Memorial lecturer every year um, rotating between uh, Wellesley College, her alma mater, which she loved so much, Harvard University's Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies, and Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts, where her daughter, Diana Spencer, yes, the same name as Prince Charles's late wife, uh, Diana Spencer, went. And so um, we are all gathered here, including we have Jeannie Wilson in the audience, who's the Davis professor at Wheaton College, and we have uh, to the two great Slavic librarians from Harvard representing um, the Davis Center and Harvard, and then a whole bunch of us Ruskies from Wellesley. Um, so that's my introduction of uh, Catherine Davis, and we can take her away because now I'm going to introduce a woman who I also hope will live to be 106 um, and have a long and wonderfully um, prosperous and exciting life. So our speaker this evening is Maria, so we can take that image off completely, is um, Maria uh, Lipman, who's known to um, her friends and um, colleagues as Masha Lipman. Um, she's the editor of a journal called Counterpoint. It's an online, online uh, journal published by the Institute of European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University in DC. She's a Russian political analyst and commentator. She was the editor-in-chief of Pro et Contra, a policy journal published by the Carnegie Mount, uh, Moscow Center for many, many years, from 2003 to 2014. And before joining Carnegie Moscow Center, Lipman was co-founder and deputy editor of two Russian weekly magazines. Um, from 2001 to 2011, Lipman wrote an op-ed column on Russian politics, media, and society for the Washington Post, which she refers to as my paper. Um, she's contributed to a variety of uh, Russian and U.S. publications, and since 2012, she's been writing a blog for The New Yorker. 
um, online, and she contributed to and co-edited several volumes on Russian politics and society, including uh, a, a book that came out just a couple of years ago called The State of Russia, What Comes Next? Most recently, she co-authored a chapter in a book uh, called Media in Russia Between Modernization and Monopoly in the New Autocracy, uh, edited by uh, Daniel, Tr oh, oh, Treisman, yeah, Treisman. He's the author of The Return, and Igor's students are reading The Return, right, in, in his uh, politics course. And she's currently a visiting lecturer at Indiana University at its School of Global and International Studies. Her lecture is called Putin's Pantheon, Tsars, uh, wait, Saints, Tsars, Saints, and, or Saints, Tsars, and Executioners. Um, it's held just days before Russia's presidential election, which is going to be held on Sunday, March 18th. And she's going to be exploring Vladimir Putin's current symbolic politics as he begins his fourth and hopefully his last <laughs> um, term as president. And she's made it clear that in the questions and answers, you are free to answer, to ask questions about the election, the poisonings, the diplomat ousters, anything Russia related would be just great. So I'm thrilled to um, warmly welcome, we're very honored to have Masha Lipman. Thank you, Masha. Davis's book on, it's called The Soviets in Geneva, on the Soviet Union and the League of Nations, if you can believe. Um, thank you, Nina, very much for this very generous introduction. Um, I'm really honored to be here, and especially uh, I didn't know so much about uh, Catherine Davis, and I'm even more <laughs> flattered now that I do. Um, uh, you are indeed quite welcome to ask questions about today. Uh, and I have to uh, say in advance that I do not know who poisoned uh, uh, the Russian spy. And uh, I mean, you, you are free to ask this question. I'm not sure I will be able to answer it. Um, so as Nina said, I will be talking about um, uh, Putin's symbolic politics and more specifically about monuments in Russia these days. Um, monuments, uh, um, I, will, I will look at monuments as an element of um, uh, symbolic politics. And monuments um, in Russia are important at least for two reasons today. First, because um, we are building a new nation after the rupture, of course, of 1991. We are no longer the Soviet Union. Then what are we? This is an important question. Uh, and if uh, um, we are a new country, if we're not the Soviet Union, then the question is, uh, what are our heroes? What are our symbols? What Russia stands for? One more reason why monuments are important is because they were so important in the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, a very, very important element of symbolic politics in the Soviet Union. Um, and of course, the most important of those was Nina's hero, <laughs> <laughs> Lenin. Um, and uh, uh, mm, uh, one more reason that is not related to Russia uh, specifically, uh, one more reason why I think monuments are relevant today is because in this country, monuments uh, were, probably still are, a controversial issue. I mean, of course, co the Confederate statues that were removed and uh, the removal, at least on one occasion, led to uh, very unpleasant consequences. And there is one more country that is engaged in remo removing monuments today, quite energetically, and that is Ukraine. Ukraine has been removing uh, its Lenins and other communist statues since uh, the beginning of the independence, but much more energetically lately. And as these two countries engage in uh, removing their statues that are deemed symbolically inappropriate, Russia, uh, in fact, has something of a monument fever, uh, erecting more and more monuments recently, and this is what I'm going to talk about, and I will get to it a little later. So um, I will first talk a little bit about uh, monuments uh, and the policy of monuments in the Soviet Union and then turn to uh, commemorative practices having to do with monuments in the early um, post-Soviet Russia and then get to uh, Putin's pantheon, 
uh, pantheon as it is reflected in the new monuments and as it exists in people's minds uh, and reflected in public opinion polls, whom Russians of today consider their most important uh, um, heroes. And as uh, I will try to show, this is not necessarily the same thing. So as historical monuments go, over the past 100 years, Russia has lived through three spells of iconoclasm and two episodes of uh, monument fever. Um, the term monumental propaganda is familiar to anyone who's ever studied or was interested in um, early Russian, early Soviet history. Um, as the um, Ancien Regime was overthrown and the Bolsheviks were building their new world um, and creating a new man, Lenin launched a plan of monumental propaganda. Um, so he issued a decree in the spring of, 19, of uh, 1918, which was called on the removal of monuments erected in honor of the czars and their servants and the drafting of projects for monuments dedicated to the Russian Socialist Revolution. A list of appropriate figures uh, um, was made of two women and 62 men, uh, mostly um, European revolutionaries as well as, uh, and revolutionary thinkers, as well as Russian academics and uh, uh, mostly men of art and literature. So these historical figures were to be commemorated uh, and venerated by the new Soviet man uh, as part of his conversion to the one and only true creed. Um, in the impatient spirit of uh, 1918, Lenin ordered that inappropriate monuments be removed in a matter of two months. Uh, so that was the first spell of iconoclasm and the first uh, monument fever uh, because new, new, new uh, uh, monuments had to be erected. The deadline two months was not met, but quite a few of ideologically inappropriate monuments were indeed removed. Um, and uh, here's, um, mm, it's actually a rare photograph of um, uh, Alexander III's statue being torn down in Moscow in summer of 1918. Um, the new monuments on Lenin's list were built in, uh, indeed uh, quite hastily and uh, um, because of uh, how the time was at the time made of shoddy material and very few of them survived. After Lenin's death, and indeed I encroach here on uh, uh, Nina's realm, um, mm, of course, uh, he became the main tool of monumental propaganda. And the first statues, the first Lenin statues, began to emerge literally overnight, as soon as the news of his death reached the nation. Um, they were of all kinds of designs and materials uh, and shapes, uh, and they were a truly, uh, truly an expression of a popular cult. But, but not, uh, by 1930s, um, the uh, um, images, the appropriate images of Lenin were canonized and monopolized by the state. So in Lenin, of course, uh, and this is, I think, uh, uh, the title of Nina's you know, book, um, uh, was endowed with the title of Forever Alive, a universally worshipped national uh, uh, founding, fathers, founding father. Uh, so the communist pantheon uh, thereby got its first uh, primary, most important uh, uh, national hero, was ubiquitous, universally recognized. Uh, recognizable. Um, uh, his statues, of course, uh, uh, adorned all the main squares of every city and streets were named after him and uh, his portraits were in every classroom and every um, auditorium. So just to give you an idea, I'm sure all of you um, uh, can recognize the image. So otherwise, the early Soviet pantheon did not change much uh, since Lenin signed his decree on monumental propaganda. Uh, and especially the pantheon of cultural figures remained unchanged for quite a number of years. Lenin's comrades in arms uh, were barely commemorated, uh, maybe because uh, before too long it was no longer clear who was a hero and who was the enemy of the people. Monuments of Stalin began to appear in early 1930s, uh, at first as a Lenin associate. 
So uh, here is one of the canons, uh, one of the earlier canons. Um, mm, uh, of course, here we have the uh, forever alive, embracing friendly, fr fr in a friendly fashion. The still alive, but already immortalized. Um, of course, uh, during that period, uh, it was party was uh, the Communist Party was the guardian of the national pantheon. All the monuments erected in the Soviet Union were commissioned by the state. The party decided which sculptors could be entrusted with building those monuments, um, uh, and of course, every sculptor was on the government payroll. Uh, all other Bolsheviks were not commemorated in stone until much later. Uh, a major monuments uh, to Dzerzhinsky, Kalinin, and Sverdlov, the three most prominent figures commemorated in stone, were not erected until uh, the 50s, 1958, the uh, 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 monument to uh, Dzerzhinsky uh, that became quite famous later on. Um, we will get to that. Kalinin in 1974, Sverdlov in 1978. Of course, in the 1940s, monuments commemorated, uh, commemorating war heroes and the victory uh, uh, in uh, World War II, the Great Patriotic War, um, uh, were appearing here and there, glorifying the Soviet victory over Nazi Germany. Uh, and this is, of course, the theme of Nina's other book. Uh, so the scope of that commemoration grew much larger, much broader on the Brezhnev after the 20th anniversary of uh, the victory in 1965 and reached gigantic proportion under Putin's rule. In 1956, uh, three years after Stalin's death, Khrushchev famously condemned Stalin's uh, uh, personality cult and mass repressions uh, in his secret speech uh, at the 20th Party Congress. But Stalin's statues still remained mostly in place. Um, so here is from um, recollections, uh, memoirs from an um, mm, uh, ambassador of Yugoslavia in Moscow in 1956, who arrived in Moscow right after Khrushchev's uh, secret speech. He wrote at that time that gigantic Stalin portraits were everywhere as if the secret speech did not happen. He also added that a Stalin portrait uh, was hanging on the wall of Khrushchev's outer office. Uh, so, uh, and it took a while, even though some people, some individuals were encouraged to remove Stalin's statues um, after Khrushchev's secret speech, it was not a policy. It was not yet a uh, nationally approved iconoclasm. Uh, it, uh, it was sporadic here and there, and it was not until 1961 um, when um, at another party congress, uh, the 22nd Party Congress, uh, Khrushchev denounced uh, Stalin once again, and uh, uh, Stalin was secretly uh, removed from the mausoleum and reburied behind it uh, near the Kremlin Wall in a pit covered with several truckloads of cement. Now, uh, uh, these days, uh, uh, Stalin's uh, uh, Stalin grave is still there, uh, and you can see it today, as well as, uh, um, as others. And you can see this bust here, which did not appear until 10 years later. Uh, this bust dates back to 1970. Uh, this uh, uh, photo uh, is very recent, uh, and we see here the leader of the Russian Communists of today, Gennady Zyuganov, laying flowers uh, to Stalin's bust, which he does every year, maybe not even once. Uh, but um, at the time when um, Stalin was reburied, uh, there, was no, uh, there was no bust, and there was no bust, as I said, for um, 10 years. That same year, Stalingrad was renamed Volgograd, uh, um, and uh, um, uh, uh, that was a real iconoclasm of gigantic proportions, larger than the first one, larger than the third. Uh, I will get to the third later. And arguably the most radical iconoclasm of this sort in the history of mankind, just given how many Stalin statues there had been, how many names, how many uh, um, street squares, etc., were named after, um, after Stalin. Um, so, uh, we now got to, uh, are getting uh, uh, slowly to the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, but uh, before um, the Soviet Union was over, there was a period of stagnation. Uh, 
And because this was stagnation, there wasn't much uh, um, change in the realm of monuments, in the realm of um, statues to historical figures. Lenins were ubiquitous still everywhere. They were war heroes and uh, uh, lots of war memorials. They were cultural figures, many of them still of the same pantheon that was uh, um, uh, um, that was in uh, Lenin's uh, um, monumental propaganda um, uh, decree. There were a few Bolsheviks that I mentioned. Um, uh, local heroes were added uh, during stagnation time. It was quite popular, but every local uh, hero was uh, had the endorsement of the central authorities. Uh, what is generally referred to as creeping re-Stalinization of uh, Brezhnev's years was not accompanied by a return of Stalin statues. So in that realm, stagnation was really stagnant. One major member uh, was added to the Pantheon during that period, and that was, of course, I think, I think a recognizable figure of Yuri Gagarin. Uh, this is a statue from 1980, but we're not talking here about a revision of uh, um, uh, Pantheon as it is reflected in the monuments. Uh, this is an addition rather than revision. Um, so uh, uh, two trends of this period as far as monuments are concerned are worth mentioning. One is the ever-growing number of World War II memorials and the emergence, um, the emergence of numerous special sector memorials, celebrating workers of particular factories or plants or members of other institutions killed in the war. Quite a lot of them, like almost every factory or plant, thought of it as necessary to erect a, uh, um, um, a monument commemorating um, their, uh, those who had worked there and were killed in the war. Um, the uh, uh, arguably the most, the grandest uh, memorial of that time is uh, Mamayev Hill in uh, Stalingrad, renamed Volgograd. It was erected uh, over a long period of time, was conceived in 59, uh, completed in 67, uh, of course, the site of Stalingrad battle. Um, so one more trend, I, I promised to <laughs> mention two trends, one more trend has to do with ideologically appropriate international figures. Um, so th there were international figures in Lenin's uh, pantheon in his uh, decree on monumental propaganda. Those were different people. Those were um, ideologically appropriate foreigners, uh, such as Mahatma Gandhi, Indira Gandhi. Uh, this is all in Moscow. Um, the uh, Vietnamese leader, Ho Chi Minh. Uh, communist martyrs of Eastern Europe. Um, and even though uh, quite a few of them emerged, they, of course, cannot claim the role of national heroes, being, of course, foreigners. Uh, these monuments can be seen as tokens of Russian uh, um, Soviet imperial sway of the time um, or um, um, a reflection of um, Soviet soft power. So now we finally got to the end of the Soviet Union and, of course, to a third spell of iconoclasm. Uh, which begins, of course, with a symbol, uh, with a very symbolic image that uh, 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 was on the front pages of newspapers at the time all over the world. And of course, it's this. It's Felix Dzerzhinsky, the founder of the Soviet secret police, uh, overthrown after the failed coup in August 91. Here's one more image of him already on the ground. Uh, so this third iconoclasm uh, proved to be much less radical than the second. Uh, a few cities and streets were indeed uh, renamed, but most Lenins were still in place. Uh, the torn down statues of um, communist heroes were irreverently dumped uh, in a park around uh, the art gallery in Moscow. Uh, the park was soon renamed the Garden of Sculptures, uh, where those statues were gradually, one after, after another, restored. But uh, not, they were not restored to the status of uh, national heroes. The, con the context of the Garden of Sculptures was quite different. In 1998, 
Uh, this sculpture was erected in the garden, um, and th this is called Victims of Totalitarian Regime. Um, so it was placed right next to the displaced monuments of, the regi of that regime's leaders. So here it is, uh, an element of it. It consists of, it, it shows 283 human heads carved of stone and piled up behind bars in a massive concrete wall. So again, here it is, and here's a fragment. So this marked the end of the long decades of the party or party state monopoly over symbolic politics. And in particular, uh, the, uh, the role of the party as the guardian of the national pantheon was over. Amidst the political turmoil of 1990s, uh, amidst failed coups, bloody clashes, and economic misery, Yeltsin's government did not have the time for symbolic politics and nation building. But 1990s became the time of a rectification of historical justice as far as monuments are concerned. Monuments to various figures and events previously deemed inappropriate or unworthy of commemoration began to appear in Moscow and elsewhere. The first step was made by the state itself, and that was the statue of Georgi Zhukov. Georgi Zhukov was, of course, the grand commander of the Soviet army uh, um, at the time of the war uh, and the great victor. But uh, it, it was his glory and popularity that made both Stalin and Khrushchev uneasy and maybe a bit apprehensive. And uh, at times, he was disfavored by both Soviet leaders and not commemorated in stone. So that was one of the first, 1995, um, right next to the Kremlin. As you can see, the statue emerged in Moscow. Most other new monuments that appeared at the time uh, were built on private initiatives or uh, on the initiatives of local governments, not the central government. Um, a, major, uh, a major example of this delayed recognition or rectification of historical justice, if you like, was uh, the first monument uh, of Vladimir Vysotsky. Uh, of course, a very, very popular bard, uh, an actor who enjoyed uh, very broad pop popular admiration, even worship, and yet was never fully, that is, officially established as a figure of national fame. Uh, this first monument to Vysotsky was followed by many more. This was, as you see, 1995, uh, and there are at least three dozen of, of Vysotsky monuments in, in, in all over Russia these days. Um, both Zhukov and Vysotsky have been repeatedly named in various opinion polls among the top 10 greatest Russians. Throughout the 90s, uh, regions and cities were rediscovering or reinventing their local histories and building their own new identities. Uh, and erecting monuments. Most of those commemorated ancient princes or saints. Nearly every historical Russian city, uh, Rizan, Tver, Vladimir, Yaroslav, what have you, uh, 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 were erecting and have today uh, their statues, monuments of um, one or another ancient prince or, or prince um, who was then canonized as a saint. Monuments of saints of national scope were, were also uh, emerging here and there in the time, and the most prominent among them is that of Cyril and Methodius. Around the same time, Moscow mayor commissioned a gigantic statue of Peter the Great. Uh, so, uh, unlike uh, the local saints and princes, this czar could actually claim uh, a symbolic value of um, um, embodying a new Russia, a ruler that was progressive, reformist, modernizing, Western-oriented. Uh, so it looked like an appropriate symbol, uh, um, and also um, it was e easily the most famous uh, Russian czar um, 
called Peter the Great, uh, um, uh, who was uh, uh, a character of novels and films in the Soviet period and had a very prominent place in the Soviet historical narrative. So it looked like uh, a new uh, um, a new symbol for a new Russia. However, um, Peter the Great uh, was the initiative, I mean, this statue was the initiative of the Moscow mayor. The Moscow mayor was not on very good terms with the Russian president, and the Russian president could not possibly accept a national symbol from the hands of the mayor whom he didn't like and with whom he was not on good terms. Besides, the statue became an, uh, the object of vicious criticism. It was deemed ugly, interfering with Moscow landscape. And I, I think uh, um, um, it is hard not to share this opinion of this statue. <laughs> Uh, so another example, another attempt uh, um, to come up with an appropriate symbol for a new Russia was initiated by um, Russian Liberal Party, the Union of Right-Wing Forces, and it was Alexander II. For the very obvious reason, the Tsar um, who liberated, uh, who put an end to Russian serfdom, so again, as Tsar liberator is a proponent of freedom or of sorts, uh, this Tsar looked like an appropriate symbol, but it didn't become one, uh, not least because by then, by the time of uh, when the uh, monument was erected, the Union of Right-Wing Forces lost popularity, was no longer represented in the Russian legislature. So the, the statue was there, but it failed to become a new symbol. Um, because of that, Alexander II, with his monument in Moscow, did not become any more recognizable, uh, any, any more known to the Russian nation than uh, he used to be before. Uh, the symbol of uh, victory, 1945, as I, will, was, uh, as I already mentioned, was steadily becoming grander and grander by the year with more and more monuments being built around Russia. A gigantic memorial was built in Moscow by the Moscow mayor, the same Moscow mayor in Paklon Negara. Uh, uh, the design that had existed in, at least since the 50s and was completed by the Moscow mayor uh, in the 90s. And more and more statues were being added to this memorial complex uh, on a yearly basis. But let me get back to the rectification of historical justice. In fact, it was a very powerful trend, and uh, um, I will list uh, only a few of those initiatives. Monuments to soldiers killed in Afghanistan, all over Russia. Before, in the Soviet period, uh, uh, families were not allowed to even write on the grave that their son, their loved one, was killed in the war. And now these, uh, it was totally private initiatives. Uh, lots and lots of those uh, graves, uh, of those monuments appeared around Russia. About 700 memorials of different scope to victims of mass repressions, of Stalin's repressions, were erected all over Russia of various scope, various sizes. Uh, here's probably the most magnificent, the most, the grandest one, uh, erected in 96 in Magadan, one of the three capitals of the Gulag, uh, made by a very famous sculptor, Ernst Nizvesny. But uh, as I mentioned, about 700 of those were erected. Some of them are very modest, some of them are big enough. Uh, Ernst Nizvesny, the sculptor who uh, made this one, had an idea of erecting three identical um, monuments of this sort in three capitals of, um, um, of the Gulag of Vrkuta, Ekaterinburg, and Magadan. Ekaterinburg got its uh, copy of the Mask of Sorrow last year. Uh, Vrkuta still doesn't have one. Um, quite a number of artistic and literary figures who were unwelcome or fell victim uh, to Stalin's repressions were also commemorated as part of fully private initiatives. Um, uh, the most prominent uh, among them are Akhmatova, Tsvetaeva, and Mandelstam. Um, and since the government no longer, the state no longer played the central role in uh, being the guardian of the national pantheon, all kinds of ironic monuments began to appear, not serious, uh, not commemorating an important event, but built just for fun. Um, uh, the number of these lighthearted statues is really very, very large, and I will quickly show you a few examples, but there are easily hundreds around Russia. So this one is a statue of processed cheese. <laughs> 
in Moscow. This one is a statue of Baltic sprats in Kaliningrad re regions where um, actually I think they fish for them. This one, uh, actually there are several of these in the Russian north. Uh, this one is in uh, Yamalo-Nenetsky Autonomous um, Okrug or Region District. Um, well, uh, sometimes uh, local initiatives are indeed quite striking. My favorite is uh, the Republic of Mariel. Uh, it's northern Volga. So uh, this is not a monument, but this is Piazza San Marco in uh, Yoshkarala, the capital of uh, Mariel. And monuments in this republic are actually uh, of, a, of a kind, uh, some of them um, uh, of the same period, historical period. Uh, so this is Lorenzo de' Medici in Yoshkarala. This is Rembrandt in Yoshkarala. Uh, this is, um, it has its own um, collection of czars. This is Elizaveta Petrovna, Russian Tsarina of the 18th century on horseback. Um, so, um, um, the list can be continued and they are really, really uh, uh, very imaginative and creative. So, um, observing the Russian monument scene in 2010, Alexei Makarkin, a prominent and highly respected Russian political analyst, wrote that in Russia, the dominance of the state as the defining and centralizing force in matters of monumental propaganda has become a thing of the past. The past, however, returned much sooner than anyone could expect. Two years later, in 2012, uh, the Russian Military Historical Society was founded and soon launched what it unabashedly referred to as the Program of Monumental Propaganda. It is written on its website. Um, so uh, the uh, uh, Military Historical Society, uh, um, in it, uh, its interests are not reduced to monuments and statues. Uh, but they account for an important part of its operation. Uh, since its foundation uh, five years ago, it has already erected 200 statues. Uh, most of them, though not all, are um, war memorials and victory statues. Um, Russian Military Historical Society is not a government operation. Uh, technically speaking, it's uh, a public organization. But its board includes uh, top-ranking officials and some of the wealthiest Russian tycoons. And as is commonly the uh, case in Russia, everyone understands that the Military Historical Society is entrusted with a very important government mission. And this means that it is assured of state grants and lavish donations. Um, so, after three spells of iconoclasm and one episode of monumental fever, we are now having a relapse of monumental fever in Russia. So, uh, um, by this new relapse, I mean that the government once again, the government has resumed its operation in the symbolic sphere. And in the course of Putin's third term, that is in the past six years, Putin has repeatedly attended inaugurations of monuments that may claim the role of new national symbols. And in the remaining part of my talk, I will uh, try to address these issues. What do these new monuments symbolize? Who are Russia's new heroes? What is the impact of this new flush of monument fever on the pantheon? Uh, that exists in people's minds and that uh, um, Russia, uh, Russian people regard as their national heroes. So several symbolically charged monuments have been erected in Moscow in a matter of just a few years. Um, this is a monument of Pyotr Stolypin, Russia's prime minister of the beginning of the 20th century. Um, Stolypin can be described roughly as a conservative reformist, uh, an image that seems to appeal to Putin. Putin has repeatedly quoted Stolypin. He again uh, um, attended the inauguration of this uh, monument, which is erected right in front of the Moscow of, of the Russian Duma in Moscow. Um, the inauguration, however, 
has not been followed by a dissemination of a Stolypin-related narrative, uh, uh, anything that would promote this figure, anything that would generate a broad recognition. Besides, uh, since 2012, the, uh, uh, when the monument was erected, the reformist language in talking about reforms uh, has gone out of fashion in Russia and uh, making this uh, symbol, which could be a good symbol for Russia probably, um, but still has not um, rooted in any way in, in Russia, has not become recognizable. And the same happened time and time again uh, with statues with monuments that were seemingly symbolic and seemingly significant. Putin would attend the inauguration, give a speech, and that is the end of the story. The monument is there, but there is no narrative. Um, so he was, here's one more example. Here's Putin uh, attending the inauguration of uh, the monument to Emperor Alexander <laughs> I. Also, at some point, um, an appropriate symbol, maybe. Uh, Alexander I, of course, took part in what we today would uh, refer to as a new world order after the Napoleonic War, on a par with other um, European leaders. Not a bad symbol for Putin, but of course not lately, not anymore. This is not part of the Russian agenda. Uh, and again, the statue is there, the monument is there, but uh, there is no narrative attached to it, and it uh, uh, um, Alexander I as an image has not become any more recognizable since then. Um, here's another emperor, Alexander III, who was notoriously conservative uh, and, uh, um, for instance, known for uh, barring the way to education for uh, members of the non-noble Russians. Um, this was not what Putin was talking about at the inauguration in Crimea, in Yalta. Uh, but again, even though Putin inaugurated, uh, attended the inauguration and gave a speech, nothing after that. Uh, Alexa uh, Alexander III did not become any more of a national hero with a narrative with broad recognition than Alexander I. So, one more. Um, this is a... Uh, 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 Prince Vladimir, uh, who christened uh, Rus in Kiev in uh, the 10th century. Um, this one may have a, uh, a better chance of becoming a new national hero uh, as a symbol of Russia, as a realm of genuine Christianity as opposed to ungodly West. Putin was talking along these lines right after the uh, uh, annexation of Crimea. Uh, but not, not since, not lately. This rhetoric has somehow faded away. Um, and yet, uh, and also Kremlin, the Kremlin refrains from drawing too much on the Russian Orthodox Church as the main source of ideology or symbolic politics. Seem, uh, I would say uh, the Kremlin seems to be reluctant or apprehensive of endowing the Church with too much symbolic power. In fact, of course, the implications of uh, um, uh, Saint Vladimir, Prince Vladimir in Moscow um, are political, but not very religious. Given the current hostility between, between Russia and Ukraine, it didn't look appropriate to have uh, the cradle of Christianity in Kiev. And because it was impossible to relocate Kiev to Moscow, Prince Vladimir was relocated uh, uh, to Moscow uh, and thereby appropriated, so to say, by, by Moscow, by Russia. Uh, and uh, well, in this way, it's kind of, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, Christianization of Rus was before Moscow even existed. Of course, Prince Vladimir never set foot here, but uh, because we have him here, it's, well, somehow Moscow is the cradle of Russian Christianity these days. So a very recent one is Mikhail Kalashnikov, the designer of the uh, deadly weapon, um, not a very good symbol. Um, Putin did not attend the inauguration, but it's still there. It's uh, downtown Moscow. It was, uh, it was erected fe uh, fairly recently. Um, uh, no, of course, no narrative. Again, he does not become a symbol, uh, maybe fortunately so. Uh, the um, monument fever, um, that uh, is associated with government operation in the symbolic sphere inspired other actors with, uh, who have, uh, also have their own ambition as symbolic entrepreneurs. 
Um, and uh, uh, sometimes some places uh, now have statues um, and monuments that the Kremlin did not initiate and probably wouldn't, but the Kremlin doesn't get in the way. So 2016, Ivan the Terrible was uh, uh, commemorated in stone in Ariol, much to the dismay of some of the people in that city. They were pro public protests. This was not the Kremlin initiative, but the Kremlin did not get in the way. Of course, Stalin's busts, of which we now have a few dozen all over Russia, uh, and especially recently, uh, 14 or 15 of them emerged in, uh, the, uh, uh, in Putin's third term alone. Uh, there is a noticeable shift of uh, um, the emergence of Stalin's busts in central Russia before uh, they were mostly emerging in, in, in the Caucasus. So here's an example. This one has been vandalized. So this is a controversial, uh, um, um, controversial bust. Uh, they are all, all of them are privately initiated. Uh, um, they are not big time, not prominently located, not in main squares, but there are more and more of them. Again, not a Kremlin initiative, but the Kremlin does not get in the way. So just as uh, Stalin's memorials uh, appear here and there, Putin himself, uh, in the end of last year, uh, attended the commemoration of a memorial, now the first ever national memorial in Moscow, commemorating the victims of political repressions, uh, called the Wall of Sorrow, um, also uh, located in downtown Moscow. In fact, uh, in uh, last year alone, two more memorials to Stalin's victims appeared in, uh, um, in Russia, one, as I mentioned already, in Yekaterinburg, and another also in Moscow, in Butova, the site of um, mass executions of 37 and 38. Uh, actually, a very magnificent memorial, a little bit like the uh, Vietnam Memorial in DC, in which all the names of all 20,000 people who were executed carved in the stone, um, uh, quite an impressive monument. So we have the executioners, uh, such as Stalin and Dzerzhinsky, whose bust appeared last year in the city of Kirov in uh, more or less northern Russia. Um, and uh, 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 commemorating the victims, uh, mourning the victims, and even uh, mm, uh, the church uh, has canonized what uh, the, the church, the Russian Orthodox Church, refers to as new martyrs, the clergy um, executed uh, during uh, Stalin's mass repressions. Uh, there is a church uh, right close to the mass, uh, to the site of mass executions in Butova called the Church of the New Martyrs. Um, so uh, um, there is nothing extraordinary or unusual about uh, in, in um, compatibility of symbols, of uh, symbols such as monuments. Of course, regimes change, political systems change. Uh, there are revolutions, liberations, uh, monarchies become, uh, uh, become uh, republics. So there's nothing unusual about that. What is peculiar about Russia is the simultaneous appearance of uh, many new statues and monuments that are incompatible symbol that have I incompatible symbolic meanings. Putin is fully aware of the existing ideological differences regarding the perception of the past. And ever since 2000, since his uh, memorial manifesto, his main programmatic article that he published, um, before he uh, became acting president in Russia, he spoke uh, about the divisions existing in the society regarding the perception of the past and emphasized the need for national reconciliation. Yet he does, doesn't seem to, uh, 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 to try to reconcile by inculcating a shared perception of the past. Instead, um, he is willing, he is willing, he's ready to uh, tolerate the differences. As long as uh, those different constituencies with their different views of the past uh, pledge allegiance to Kremlin and Putin himself and are kept under control. This all-embracing and or even a maneuverous approach implies that one can be a monarchist or a Stalinist or a religious fundamentalist uh, or a uh, lover of Brezhnev or Lenin uh, and each one is free to venerate his and her uh, uh, respective symbol, 
as long as one pledges allegiance to the regime. This is hardly a reconciliation for the sake of unity, rather a pacification for the sake of stability. And um, as the, uh, the Kremlin refrains from imposing this one and only true perception of the past, it is building a symbol of defenses against unwelcome ideological competition, which is coming from the West or Western agents within, agents in quotation marks, of course. Both are seen as undermining uh, the Russian state or its political regime. This all-embracing or omnivorous approach to the past is best illustrated by a new monumental project in downtown Moscow called an Alley of Rulers. And uh, uh, you cannot see them well, but uh, uh, these are images, sculptured images, of all Russian rulers from ancient saints through the czars and emperors uh, to uh, um, the leaders of the Soviet Union and down to the unloved Gorbachev and Yeltsin. The sculptor said that he is ready to add Putin's bust at any moment when he is commissioned. Another example of such wholesale approach is the soon to be built, already announced, an alley of patriarchs. This one will include sculpted images of all the patriarchs of the Russian Orthodox Church since its uh, inception, since its beginning. And apparently this all embracing approach uh, is aimed at hushing down the uneasy issue of co the collaboration of um, the Russian Orthodox Church with the Bolsheviks and with state security bodies during the Soviet period. The government's demand for monumental propaganda generates supply. And uh, about uh, 200 monuments that have been erected by the Military Historical Society, of course, means lucrative commissions for sculptors. There are a few champions already. There is especially one sculptor, Salavat Sherbakov, who made the statue of Kalashnikov, among others, who boasts of having erected 120 statues, most of them during the recent period. Um, so the, the, the new monumental fever opens opportunity for sculptors, but what about its impact on the Russian national pantheon as it exists in people's minds? Whom do Russian people today regard as their national heroes? Um, the website of um, uh, the Russian Military Historical Society opens, uh, yeah, this is uh, a close up on some of those rulers. So on the, um, the first page on, online, um, on the website of the Russian Military Historical Society, there's a quote from Putin. Our country needs heroes, and everyone should know who they are. They should serve as role models for the young people growing up today and for their children. This is very important. Uh, this is uh, uh, the end of Putin's quote. And although Putin says that this is very important, the new Russian pantheon, uh, as it exists in uh, people's minds and as it is reflected uh, in public opinion polls, um, also reflects the Kremlin's uncertainty and this lack of narrative and this lack of a common practice of inculcating the images of those new, new, new heroes. Um, monuments of Lenin, um, mostly ignored in the government rhetoric, uh, and on several occasions criticized by Putin, Lenin himself, not the monuments, of course, still remains uh, by far the most numerous ones in Russia. Uh, and uh, 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 Lenin also is among the top, most famous, most prominent, most significant Russians um, uh, in the public opinion polls. The next one is Pushkin. Of course, uh, monuments are also ubiquitous, not as numerous as Lenin's, but still quite, quite, quite a few. Um, and what about the new ones? The new ones that um, um, whose inauguration Putin attended. Uh, the commemoration in stone of the czars, saints, and princes um, inaugurated as part of this new um, monument fever, the Alexanders, Stalipin, Prince Vladimir, Nicholas II, there is a statue uh, in Crimea. Uh, Nicholas II, of course, is also canonized by the Russian Orthodox Church as a martyr, failed to make them members of the Russian pantheon, again, as reflected in public opinion polls. 
Uh, in fact, judging by the public opinion polls, the national pantheon has not changed much since the Soviet days. Um, of the top 10 most significant Russians, most belong in the same pantheon that we had in the Soviet Union. So here, is, uh, um, uh, here are the results of three different opinion polls from 2003, 2008, uh, 2017. And as you see, uh, the characters are pretty much the same. Um, those czars that appear in these uh, public opinion polls, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, uh, Catherine the Great has not featured in the new commemorations. Uh, and I think that their uh, emergence in the, these lists uh, is uh, uh, the result of uh, the Soviet narrative, Soviet school books, the fact that they're great, that this, uh, uh, um, that uh, uh, great is a part of their names, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great. Um, but none of the Alexanders, not Nicholas II, is, uh, is part of that list. Uh, Zhukov, as I mentioned, was a rectification of justice. This, he was a figure who existed in the Russian pantheon, in the Soviet pantheon, even though uh, um, there had not been statues. Um, and uh, uh, um, uh, the same is true of um, um, uh, Ovusotsky, uh, who comes, um, I think, uh, right after, maybe. Um, um, anyway. Uh, uh, if uh, uh, these um, uh, these figures, this uh, these characters, uh, these historical figures, are still members of uh, the new pantheon of today, there is obviously, as you look at this list, one figure who is really new, and this is Putin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, monuments to Putin coming up. Um, we uh, have opening the floor to questions. To questions about uh, anything relevant at the issue. Are there any statues to Putin previously constructed? No, not really. Uh, there are all kinds of images uh, in. Online, uh, you have all kinds of videos, uh, animations. Uh, you have, of course, tons of portraits. Is there an informal rule that you must be dead before you can have a statue? Uh, well, the informal rule has it that, uh, in fact, there are commissions, uh, usually urban commissions in uh, municipalities, and one has to be dead for a while before a monument is, uh, is erected. Uh, there are actually sometimes uh, there are exceptions to the rule, uh, but of course, yeah, one has to, one has to be dead. Uh, well, this is not always. Uh, uh, this is, uh, as I said, a rule with exceptions. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about this uh, project by our mutual friend Sergey Parkhomenko, uh, the last address, mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to tell people about the project, but. Uh, what, what's the reaction of the government, both on a national level and on the local levels uh, mm -hmm. to that? Yeah, of course I will, yeah. Uh, last address is a uh, private initiative initiated by a prominent civic activist, Sergei Parhomenko, whom uh, Dmitry mentioned. Um, it is similar to um, a German project of stepping stones. Uh, I'm sure many of you know about it or have seen it um, in Germany and now I think uh, in many other European countries. These are names of the victims of the Holocaust that are engraved in uh, the stones in the sidewalk and pavement. Um, in Russia, uh, the project takes after that and uh, the, the inspiration came from Germany. Um, it is not done on the ground, uh, but uh, these are very small um, plaques about this size with a, sm a small opening where you expect to, to see a face, but in fact it's blank, there is nothing there. And very basic information is uh, um, listed on this, uh, on this plaque. Um, these are people who were uh, executed, not just repressed, but executed. And it's called the last address because these are homes, houses um, from which they were taken away, arrested, 
prosecuted and, uh, and executed. So what is there is the date of birth, uh, the date of arrest, the date of execution, and the occupation of that person. Um, the pro uh, the uh, project was launched a few years ago. Um, there are, I think, uh, the number of blocks so far in terms of hundreds. I'm not quite sure how many today, but my guess is maybe 400. Um, it started in Moscow, but it's now, um, now it is in many other uh, cities in Russia. And even beyond Russia, there are some in Ukraine. I know that there was probably a couple in the Czech Republic. They were interested and they uh, did that too. They invited this group. Uh, they have a website that uh, um, uh, you can go to and see, and um, um, they track down their activities. And basically, every weekend, uh, uh, a new plaque or a series of plaques um, um, are installed. Um, the government doesn't seem to mind, but as I said, Putin himself inaugurated uh, this national memorial, the first ever national memorial to the victims of Stalin's repressions in Moscow. So this is not, um, uh, um, this does not run counter to um, uh, the government initiative, and the memorial itself was Putin's initiative. It was a decree that he had signed early on as part of a much grander program of destalinization. Uh, the program was not implemented. Basically, mem the memorial was the only thing that uh, um, uh, the only item on that program that was implemented, but it does not run counter. So probably that was um, the reason why the government doesn't mind, even though the government in general is uh, increasingly intolerant to autonomous civic initiatives. It is also um, up to, um, for, um, mm, mm, the initiative is not enough. Every resident of that uh, apartment building on which the plot is installed has to sign that he or she does not mind. So this is a long procedure, and this is why there are not so many. So uh, if there is a single person who says, no, I don't want this block on my building, on our building where my apartment is, it will not be installed. Yes, you. Um. This question is suggested by one of the lines that, that you that you introduced, the um, the joke. Uh, it's not at all the same, but it's suggested. But and this is purposefully distorted, sort of surreal kinds of imagery in some of the statues. For instance, in Saint Petersburg, Shumyakin, mm -hmm. this really incredible statue of Peter the Great in mm -hmm. the Pavlovka uh, Sphinx, or to some extent Sakharov's statue mm -hmm. near the Academia Novaya. Well, mm -hmm. Um, I wonder what kind of resonance and what kind of support those have, those have had, mm -hmm. but that's a continuing line in many kinds mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. <coughs> um, Well, Sakharov is a very uh, important, uh, it, it, it's not, not only is that a private initiative, it is small, it is actually mi minor compared to the grand statues that are erected under the auspices of the government. It remains a private initiative. There is uh, a street in Moscow named after Sakharov, um, named actually back in the 90s. But Sakharov is uh, a peculiar example of uh, an ideal post-Soviet hero, a man who um, um, dedicated his life uh, to the uh, uh, um, fighting against a non-free system of the Soviet Union. So in the um, early period, the early enthusiasm in the 90s, it was possible to name a street. I'm sure no street would be named after him today. But renaming such a street uh, would be too much. Uh, and this has to do with uh, um, what I was talking about at the very beginning. We did not remove statues. We are all embracing. Sakharov is there, fine. Uh, Sakharov and Stalin, fine too. Uh, Sakharov and uh, uh, now in the alley of rulers has all of them, uh, you know, Lenin, Stalin, Brezhnev, and even the uh, very brief ones who were dying basically on a yearly basis. Uh, um, uh, uh, the the uh, um, Chernyenko and Andropov, who were actually uh, presided over the system that uh, uh, persecuted Sakharov. 
it's all embracing. We can have a Sakharov Avenue in Moscow, that's not a problem. We can have a modest uh, ma monument of Sakharov in St. Petersburg. This does not make him a national hero. Uh, but what makes one a national hero? It turns out what seems uh, of interest to me is even the uh, inauguration uh, in uh, uh, Putin's speech at the inauguration doesn't make Alexander the Third or the First or Stolypin or whoever a hero recognized by the nation either. As for Shemakin's, um, well, again, uh, Shemakin's is much more of a piece of art than uh, an, an element of symbolic politics. Um, the uh, element of symbolic politics that Peter the Great could have become after the ugly Moscow monument did not happen, as I said. First, because it was so ugly and people made fun of it. And second of all, because uh, uh, Yeltsin at the time, Yeltsin's government would not recognize him as a national hero because it was the initiative of Lushkov. So each time there can be a reason uh, but uh, the fact of the matter, and what is important to me, and what is actually, I think, a broader issue, is that um, um, to the extent that Putin's regime today is more ideological than it used to be, it does not extend to inculcating a shared vision of the past. Uh, I, I'd like to disagree <laughs> with, with part of it because I'm very interested in the, uh, the politics of the history of the 1990s mm -hmm. um, and the collapse of the Soviet Union. How is that being depicted? Mm -hmm. So there was this Yeltsin Center that was built in um, uh, just recently in Yekaterinburg with a bust or a statue, I remember, of Yeltsin. Mm -hmm. um, and then I and my students in my Putin first year seminar um, just read Putin's presidential address on March 1st, so just basically the week before last, um, in which he keeps referring back to the 90s, or at least saying, in the year 2000, all these terrible things were, and then we've improved so much, we've improved so much, and you sort of get this feeling of how, free, how long can he continue going back to the 1990s when that was already almost 20 years ago? You know, so I think there is a set vision of the 1990s is a terrible time, which it was in many ways, but it was also the time of the birth of democracy and the end of communism and the closing of the last gulag camp, you know, and all these things. So I think um, that, uh, I think the Kremlin is, is really invested in a particular vision of the 1990s that everybody should have. What do you think? Um, Yes and no. Uh, I mean, yeah, of course, yes. Of course, yes. In the wild 90s has become a cliche that uh, um, has been in use in political rhetoric and very broad public rhetoric uh, basically since the beginning of Putin's tenure. And yet we do have Yeltsin Center in the Yekaterinburg, right. right? So it is, Nobody in a sense, it. a uh, mm, presidential center as they go. And I'm sure it was inspired by the presidential centers in this country. Right. Like outgoing president is entitled to a, a museum, a center, a library, and this is what Yeltsin Center is. It is a museum, a center, a library. Uh, but this does not mean that we as a nation regard Yeltsin as a national hero or a prominent figure. Uh, we do have him in this alley of rulers that I showed to you. But again, this does not mean that you know, the nation suddenly is, uh, wakes up to a sense that after all, uh, his contribution to Russia, his service to his nation uh, was something, something good, something that we should uh, respect, uh, if not revere. Uh, can one be a, a worshiper of Yeltsin or a fan of Yeltsin? Of course, no problem, no problem, as long as one is, uh, uh, pledges allegiance to the regime and to Putin. Uh, so you can be uh, a fan of Yeltsin, you can be a fan of Stalin, you can be a fan of Nicholas II, and we even have a female worshiper of uh, Nicholas II, um, a former chief prosecutor of Crimea, not, not just somebody uh, un un unimportant. Um, you can be anything. Um, what is 
not uh, encouraged and what is strongly discouraged is um, uh, dissemination of uh, liberal westernizing values. That's for sure. But uh, yes, there is this perception. Uh, there is this perception of the 90s. Uh, but um, Putin personally never said a nasty thing about Yeltsin. He has this special decency about himself, I would say. He, uh, um, he uh, um, is certainly quite loyal to the memory of his mentor, former mayor of uh, St. Petersburg, Anatoly Sobchak. And by the same token, he has respect for um, the person who anointed him for presidency. Never said a nasty thing about him. Um, all of this coexists. So I don't think there's a contradiction, uh, uh, I mean, with what I said, but there is certainly a contradiction between having a Yeltsin memorial in Yekaterinburg uh, and uh, uh, mm, this pervasive, very broad perception of the 90s as the time of chaos and uh, 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 referring to the 90s as wild. Yeah, but then I also have a question. If you can be anything, then why erect all these monuments and conduct this monumental propaganda if you don't impose a certain national identity? This is an excellent question. Uh, really, thank you so much. Um, um, this is certainly not a, um, uh, driven by a desire to um, um, create a sense of, uh, of anything like the Soviet Union was. In the Soviet Union, everything was so clear. We had a founding father. He was forever alive. We have this one and only true theory, one only uh, true creed. Uh, the history is simple. Ancien regime uh, was bad. The new, uh, the new world was good, etc. The sense that uh, Putin's regime is trying to inculcate is that um, state leaders are infallible. And uh, uh, no regime, uh, whether czarist, imperial, uh, princedoms uh, that existed before, um, should be criticized. Uh, the state is dominant. The state should be respected. Uh, and no period should be criticized as such, and especially no leader. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, expressed most vividly in a uh, permanent history park, an exhibition of history park called Russia, My History that you find in Moscow. And these days, more and more cities have replicas of those. Uh, and th those history parks are, uh, in an even more unabashed way, uh, a praise of every ruler, beginning from uh, uh, very old times. So it is this sense, not a particular picture, but a very broad, um, and I would say very quickly getting blurred picture of, we don't go into detail. We don't, uh, because the minute when we try, when we begin looking at details, like Alexander III really issued this decree which barred the way to education for people who were not noble. Is it good? Of course not. And he kicked the Jews out of Moscow too, by the way. Yeah, that was not a good thing to do either. Uh, so uh, the minute we, we get to the detail, it gets very controversial and wrong. But this overall picture of infallible leadership, I think, is what's behind it. And what's behind, you know, now we have that, that leader and this ruler and this prince and that czar and even, and even Yeltsin and uh, Gorbachev, who is, by the way, still alive, uh, are commemorated in stone. You know, this is one of the exceptions of, uh, you know, one has to be dead to be commemorated in style. So um, we have, uh, you were talking about the great Sakharov. We have a stepdaughter here, Tatiana Nikolaevich. So you have a question? Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you in yeah. person. Yeah. Um, my question, um, or rather um, uh, comment or thought, is that something I would like to very much to hear your comment on. Um, I have for some time now, um, been wondering and also hear from my friends in Russia that there is a phenomenon of a split or even schizophrenic mentality. And in a way, your very good um, 
and interesting uh, presentation, uh, I think also um, uh, makes one think of that. Uh, wouldn't it be uh, kind of mind-boggling? And doesn't it really reflect that type of split personality that all these images can exist at the same time on the same plane, in the same country, sometimes in the same city. And uh, doesn't it make everyone uh, confused <laughs> and possibly even schizophrenic? What do you think? Uh, frankly, I don't think so. Uh, if one is, again, if one is uh, a worshiper of Nicholas II, he cannot care less about others. I mean, he can be, uh, he can engage in fierce debate uh, which is okay. It it really happens, but but uh, in theory it, it is. So in one person's mind, um, if you are a, if one is a monarchist again, or a Stalinist, or a proponent of uh, you know uh, thinks of Brezhnev's years as a golden age, it is his and her belief, and that's not a problem. Where I would say um, in the government itself, as I said practices this uh, blurred, intentionally blurred and uncertain and fuzzy approach to history, which actually enables the regime to, to be flexible and not to bind itself with uh, any creed and any set of um, historical, uh, of, of any, any set vision of the past. Um, where I do find uh, a kind of a controversy within one head is the perception of Stalin, who, as you saw in this picture, uh, appears as one of uh, the top, the, yeah, the first here, third there, uh, uh, the closer to today, the higher Stalin uh, rises as the member, as the primary member of um, uh, the Russian pantheon. So uh, when you look at public opinion polls about Stalin, you see people seeing him as a butcher and a monster and recognizing that the number of people who were innocent people who were oppressed are in terms of millions. And at the same time, seeing him as a great statesman and seeing him as the mastermind of victory in World War II, in the Great Patriotic War, which is still seen as by far, by far the most important event, the most important achievement, and the most important, uh, uh, the most broadly shared perception of, of, uh, of the past. Um, these two coexist in the same head. If you look, well, uh, I mean, the, they will not be like 50 and 50 they will probably be uh, uh, in numbers that clearly overlap. So in the same head, this perception of Stalin coexists. Uh, coexist. Um, call it schizophrenia. Well, there is something to it. And uh, um, I'm not sure if the name of Arsenio Raginsky is familiar to this audience. A very, very prominent civic activist who unfortunately died recently, the founder of the Memorial Society who dedicated his life to the commemoration of uh, collecting the material, work in the archives, um, uh, commemoration of the victims of, uh, uh, of Stalin and the Soviet regime in general. He recognized the, um, um, the controversy and the impossibility, the irresolvability of this con controversy. There is nothing uh, to be done about the victory in the war uh, uh, being the most important event, and there is nothing to be done about Stalin as a butcher. So phew, I think this is a controversy that is not in people's mind, that is a controversy in the Russian history, in the Soviet history, if you like. Other than that, I don't see this uh, per split of personality, and I don't think uh, the coexistence of um, you know, all these different visions of the past is actually a problem. In fact, I would like to see more diversity in politics. Uh, what uh, the paradox here is that we don't have any political competition, we don't have uh, uh, um, political alternatives, 
But in history, we have this very broad range of possibilities how you can look at uh, the Russian past. So I'd rather it were the opposite, or that there were diversity in both these realms, the political and the perception of the past. So I guess we have time for a couple more questions. Um, uh, Rachel, is there a question? Um, I was wondering if you think that the current regime like, has been or will be successful in convincing people to look at the, the broader picture of the past rather than just like more recent past. Um, well, I think the major concern of the regime is not to inculcate a certain vision of the past. The major concern is to keep things stable. Uh, and this is just one of the instruments, one of the tools, reconciling different visions of the past so that they would not lead to political turmoil. That's the point. It's not that uh, there is an interest uh, among the decision makers in the Kremlin to inculcate a certain vision of the past and not doing this because it is too in insurmountable uh, uh, a task. Um, it, it, the point is not that. And uh, uh, the point is to uh, uh, keep people reasonably acquiescent. If it takes to allow them to have different visions of the past, that's fine, as long as they pledge allegiance to the regime and do not uh, uh, you know, do not get funny ideas that maybe the government that they have should not be there or some such. And this mission, this, this task is actually implemented in the symbolic politics, this peculiar uh, way that the government uh, um, goes about it, um, allowing this diversity, actually not inculcating, uh, serves this goal, serves this goal too. So always rolling. Um, thank you. It's a fabulous uh, lecture. So I'm really interested in this last slide. This is the Pantheon of National Heroes. I mean, it's essentially Soviet. Because looking at it, it looks like the Pantheon of National Heroes remains also essentially czarist. Um, you know, a good half of the, you know, the national heroes are czarist. And I guess it made me wonder, really, for the first time, why didn't the Bolsheviks do a better job of just <laughs> eradicating, you know, all of that czarist? I mean, I guess you can make the argument, right? Of course they did a better job. Of course they did. Well, because uh, for them, there was no, you know, diversity was anathema, right? It was one and only creed. You knew exactly what you had to believe. It was the same school curriculum, uh, you know, from east to west, from Estonia to Tajikistan. Uh, you know, the same... Uh, uh, presiding bo the same body that presided over the historical narrative uh, that was her own to per perception year after year. Of course they did a get better job. Uh, uh, today's government does not have that and actually does not strive at that. It is, uh, czarist I think uh, is one way to put it, it's focused on uh, the dominance of the state and the state dominated by the leader. That's the point. Gagarin is, uh, one exception. Zhukov is another, which is interesting. Uh, um, uh, well, Zhukov, of course, is, uh, um, there, were, there, there was this rivalry, in a sense, rivalry with Stalin, that, and that was why he, he could not be fully recognized, probably, because Stalin had to be the mastermind of victory. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, of course, Pushkin is our everything, uh, but uh, Generally speaking, of course, all of them, nearly all of them, are, are, are rulers. But there's also the Lomonosov, yeah. Tolstoy, um, Well, um, right, uh, uh, that's, that's true. Uh, Lomonosov only uh, emerged in 2003, and that was not a national poll. Second, 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 second. Oh, it has, yeah, right, you're right, you're right, yeah, 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 yeah. Lomonosov is there. Mm -hmm. Well, but, yeah. Culture, culture, and this too, uh, uh, you know, this was of course uh, Putin and uh, Putin, Pushkin and Lermontov and Tolstoy uh, were also part of Lenin's pantheon. But also, excuse me, but think about the um, opening ceremony of the Sochi Olympics. It was a celebration of Russian culture, and you had the literary greats and, and so on, and that was really, that was all incorporated into the grandeur and greatness that's Russia. 
It was, but uh, uh, the opening ceremony is a very interesting example. Uh, um, the ceremony could not be done overnight. It was prepared for quite some time, and when uh, Russia first won the right to hold the Olympics in the Russian territory in Sochi, uh, the perception and the, uh, uh, Russia's relations with the world beyond was different. Uh, and it was common as we watched the ceremony, which I think was gorgeous, yeah. uh, there was this sense of this is already becoming anachronistic. It, was, it, it does not belong in uh, uh, the, the current uh, international uh, Russian relations with the world at that point. Well, of course, and then Ukraine happens. You know, almost, Korea almost Korea instantly, happens. almost so instantly. So there's a young gentleman in the back who wanted to ask a question. That would be our last one, if that's okay. Any reaction in Russian media uh, to the controversy around monuments here? The about the right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, really very. Yeah. Very little. Very little indeed. Um, uh, of course, there's much more um, reaction to Ukraine, and that's it actually. I'm not avoiding your question, but uh, it was interesting because the government does not uh, worship Lenin. There is no Lenin worship today, unlike the Soviet Union. But we do not remove our Lenins, Ukrainians do. And we despise them for that. So uh, <laughs> that was kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, we bring uh, Prince Vladimir, we bring him from Ukraine to Russia. Uh, so we have all three Vladimirs, as the saying went, at the same time, at, at the time, right? Uh, including, uh, including Putin. No, there wasn't much. Uh, there wasn't much. Uh, uh, I think uh, the, uh, it is always a difficult question because which Russia are you talking about? Uh, the uh, online media in Moscow or in general. I, I think the, uh, the official reaction focused more on the ugliness of the racists. Uh, one more reason to say look at this shiny democracy, this uh, Shiny house on the hill. Uh, look what is happening there. Uh, look how ugly they get. They're fascists. Something like that. Um, the removal itself. Uh, I, I don't think there was a focus on that. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Russia.